completed 52 projects, we're still supporting them, they're still ongoing, all of them. Expect all the, the projects on the fund to provide information or guides or business models. So each project has three partners, there's a technology partner, there's a research partner and there's the organisation with the arts project. Now, all the projects we funded to test their proposition rigorously, this is the key thing. Um, they have to be honest about their findings, um, whether it's good or bad. Um, the projects that prove that something doesn't work are as valuable as those that prove something does work. That's a nice website or the Tate have done a great app. Um, but they don't know whether it's worked. They don't actually prove whether things actually work or not and what you need to do to implement that. I don't try to use it, um, here it is, uh, to get smuggled across the border to the independent Republic of Congo. And I'm uh, not playing space for this show. It started to, to become incredibly involved in terms of events, arts and participation, whereas I predominantly just used it as a marketing tool. To shift, I think, I think as the public purse or funding becomes less, then there's more, uh, there's more of a notion about how can you commercialise, how can we make, where can you generate income from. When you start looking at the creative sector, there's incredible growth, 60% growth since 2004 in this particular sector. is just to do with numbers, it's to do with demographics, footfall and measuring that. If we're spending 20,000, 30,000 pound on a particular event, how will that translate itself into shopping centres increase in sales? That's where the bottom line has been, we need to bring some income back. We're willing to invest, but how can we commercialise this? Art is going into that kind of territory. And I'm interested in thinking about those kinds of experiences. I'm interested in the idea of ambient literature. Some of you might think of things that you've read, things that books, stories that you know. There's a whole literature of psychogeography. There are writers like W.G. Seabold. Anybody here read W.G. Seabold? And of course, the thing that you understand when you start to experience a work like that, or when you write a work like that, is that as the world unfolds, so you unfold as a human being. So you have an experience where you meet the world and it's unfolding. Next time you're on a beach in Brazil and people ask you to do things, think a bit more, don't just say yes. <laughs> because uh, as far as zombies go, zombies are art to a certain extent. And we generally look at taking things that people don't normally like and twist them into something that they will and use it as a point of focus. And we make things bigger than they should be quite often. It becomes a point of conversation for people. And we believe very strongly that the most important thing is to make people ask questions. Because anyone they've asked questions and worked out what the good question is, will they get the right answer? Because I work predominantly in the public spaces, and how can we police it, and how can we change it, and how can we have some sort of control of it? To govern their public space, they need to really address it and start asking what can happen and what can do. At this very moment, most of our land is being sold off, that's normally public, public, and we're, I've got an opportunity to feed in and say, do this, and maybe it won't turn into psychopathic nightmare forever, forever, forever. And as we're getting it, our social behaviour patterns have been controlled on a global scale by new landowners.